All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the American Family Insurance Dream Bank, where we believe in the transformative power of dreams. For those of you who are familiar with Dream Bank, welcome back. And for those of you who are joining us for the first time, welcome. I'm Jenna, and I'm thrilled to have you with us today. Here at American Family Insurance, we believe communities are stronger and the future is brighter when people are actively pursuing their dreams. That's why we created Dream Bank, an inspirational community de destination and digital experience dedicated to dreamers everywhere. From our event series to immersive signature programs, there's something for every dreamer. Our offerings are designed to help you celebrate the dream journey, overcome obstacles, and stay motivated. Now, I'd like to introduce you to our speaker. Lauren Fenton is a writer with a special interest in the intersection between homes and sustainability, and is the author of the Living Small newsletter and two interior design books, The Book of Living Small and The Bug Bed Book. She has written about home and design for nearly 20 years, and her work has appeared in many outlets, including Better Homes and Gardens, House Beautiful, Real Simple, and The Washington Post as well as the online publications and regional design magazines. Laura is here to talk to us about why Living Small is sustainable. Welcome, Laura. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk to everybody today. Um, and I'm gonna start by sharing my screen. Okay. Um, so before I, first of all, Jenna, thank you for the awesome introduction. Um, before I tell you a little bit more about myself, um, I wanna invite all of you to take just a minute to think about why you signed up to attend this virtual event today. Um, maybe you're already living small and you wanna make the most of your small space. Um, perhaps you're considering downsizing. Maybe you're aspiring to lead a more sustainable lifestyle. Um, whatever your motivation, I hope to offer you some actionable advice and inspiration um, over the course of this conversation. I will also be taking questions from the audience at the end. So um, if you have one, write it down. You are welcome to add it to the chat um, while we're speaking today. I will try to keep my eye on it, but um, best bet will be to put it in the chat at the end when we are taking questions. So why living small is smart and sustainable. I, all right, let's see here. So me, Laura Fenton, um, as Jenna said, I'm a long time writer. I've written a lot about small spaces and um, also about how homes and sustainability sort of cross paths. My first book, Little Book of Living Small, um, is what I call a comprehensive guide to small space secrets. Um, we featured 12 homes of real families, and these were people who chose to live in a small space. Um, and I like to make that distinction because um, sometimes you're living in a smaller space than you would like, and that's not by choice, but the people featured in my book um, were people who had all made a choice. And living in homes of 1,200 square feet or less. Then my newsletter is um, distributed weekly, bi-weekly to free subscribers, and it's all about living small and sustainably. So this is not just something I write about. It's it's my life. It's how I live. Um, I live in 690 square feet, in New York City, my husband and son. And I'm just going to take you guys in a little quick tour of my home so you can get a sense of where I'm coming from. Uh, here is our floor plan, my, our mighty 690 square feet. Um, when we bought this house, we were expecting our first child and we made the brave decision to buy what was being marketed as a one bedroom and convert it to a two bedroom uh, because it made the most sense for us financially. Our families all thought we were crazy, but we've been living here for almost nine years. And um, there's our little bedroom that used to be the dining alcove. You can see the kitchen off to the left and built a happy life here. So that's where I'm coming from, both personally and professionally. Um, so what we'll cover today. 
Why is choosing to live small smart? How is living small sustainable? The first steps to living small and maintaining a small and sustainable life. And then I have a little homework for you and then we'll take questions at the end. So why is choosing to live small smart? For me, this was a conscious choice. Um, I could have stretched my budget to have a bigger home, but I preferred to save my money for other things. My friends might have grander spaces, but I don't think that they're any happier for it. In fact, I suspect we have a better deal. My family gets to live in a city that we love, but we have less stress with a lower mortgage payment. Our renovations were relatively cheap because our place is small. We have less clutter in our lives. My son certainly has fewer toys to pick up. Our kitchen is tiny, but it's a model of efficiency. And our wardrobes are edited down mostly to things that we love. Best of all, my husband and I stay for the long haul. We have a place that will feel quite spacious when our son moves out. And we have the peace of mind of knowing that we're living lightly on the earth. My family is living our best lives in less than 230 square feet per person. I believe that choosing to live in a small space is smart and sustainable. Here is why it's smart. Whether rented or owned, a small home costs less. And that's both to either purchase or rent in the first place, but also to keep up. I can't tell you, like this one is just huge. It's so freeing to have a small housing pavement every month. Um, that has allowed me to be adventurous with my career, to travel more, save more for retirement, buy an investment property that I rent out as a vacation home, None of this would have been possible if I had done what was expected and moved into a bigger apartment as my child got older. A small home is also easier to maintain. Less space means less to clean. Fewer belongings means less to keep organized. Um, small space living, you know, comes with its drawbacks, but this is one where I can say for certain, having spent time in larger houses, small space dwellers are winning. A small space also inspires, maybe we would even say forces simplicity with less space to squirrel away our extra belongings. We end up living with the things that we truly love and use. There's a lot less waste because of this. Um, when you're in a small space, you don't accidentally forget where all the ski gear was stashed and go out and buy more because there's no place for it to hide. So all this sort of advantages of small space living, I find they manifest themselves in all parts of your life. You have less stress. You have less to worry about the cost and the work of keeping up a larger home. Um, my first book came out right at the beginning of the stay at home time during COVID-19. And I checked in with all of the families who'd been featured in my book. And the thing that I heard over and over again was that people were grateful for their small mortgage payments. Um, that they were relieved to know that they could afford to stay in their home during that uncertain time. And that relief of stress, I think is huge. More time, we talked about maintenance. If you spend less time keeping up your home, not to mention a large property, you have time to pursue other things. Um, people who live small have more money. Housing costs are real. And the last one is a little more abstract, but more meaning. Um, with this idea of editing our homes down to be smaller, more compact, 
it means that the things you choose to keep, what gets to stay, that's usually the stuff that matters. So why is this all sustainable? It's, as we just talked about, financially sustainable, certainly. Um, but it's sustainable in the grander thing of a uh, scheme of things. One of the reason I wrote my books, one of the reasons I write the newsletter every week is because choosing to live in a smaller space is one of the biggest levers that an individual can pull to address the climate crisis. You can tote your reusable shopping bags. You can buy zero waste shampoo. You can do all of those things. But if you're living in a 5,000 square foot house, you've got a pretty hefty carbon footprint. Um, and I'll put a pin right here before I go to the next slide, just to say what, what is small, right? Um, I don't have a strict definition of what a small space is. A small space to me might be a large one to you. Um, it's relative. And if you've been living in a really big house, downsizing to 2,000 square feet might feel small. For me, coming out of my first university dorm room, I thought having my own bedroom in a 300 square foot apartment was huge. So it's, it's all relative. Yeah. Um, but it's really about the idea of choosing not to upsize. So why is small sustainable? Smaller homes use less energy. Um, there's less to heat, there's less to cool, there's less to light up. Um, you automatically bring your carbon footprint way down by just being in a space that needs less energy to operate day to day. Small spaces require less materials. Now this is both like the, to build it in the first place, um, a small house required fewer trees, less steel, less tile, but it's also in the furnishings too. Um, I have friends who, live in bigger houses in the suburbs and they have couches in three different rooms. Um, so that's three times as much couch that needed to fill their house. And part of what happens then is that in consuming more, you also consume lower quality things. Um, take my friends with their three couches probably going to have to go with a cheaper, less high quality couch if you need to buy three of them instead of one. And that's going to be three times more lumber, fabric, foam that will eventually end up in a landfill. So living small is automatically making you consume less. And some of that's in less obvious everyday ways. Um, for example, Let's say you've got a small fridge like I do. That means that you'll buy a little bit less on each grocery run and the food that you buy will be less likely to get lost in some deep dark corner of an enormous double do door fridge. Uh, always living small sort of heightens consciousness about consumption. Um, and I think that it also changes how you think about consumption. When your storage space is scarce, you're much less likely to purchase something just because it's on sale. Small space dwellers are generally much more careful consumers because they have to think about where things are gonna go. Then thinking a little bigger picture too, um, if you're renovating a small space, or if you're lucky enough to be building one, you can justify spending a little more on earth-friendly materials because you have fewer of them to buy. So that handmade domestic tile and reclaimed lumber is easier to splurge on when you need a small amount of it. 
Maybe you could even afford to install solar panels or a heat pump hot water heater or a premium induction stove because you didn't spend your extra dollars on extra square feet. <clears throat> and then last, living small also often means living within a city. Um, and city living is actually the most low carbon lifestyle of all. Moving to the suburbs automatically means driving more, greater carbon footprint, and households in the inner city consume less than those both in the suburbs and even way out in the country. So that's another way that living small is sustainable. So what does it mean for you? Um, in today's world, so often our dreams are focused on things being more than they are today. A bigger house more extravagant travel, a new car, better wardrobe, a promotion, a larger salary. But instead, it's worth asking, is what you have enough? Or maybe you're living in a big house and you can't imagine how you'd live with less. I understand that. Um, but if the big house is eating up every cent of your paycheck every month, it might be worth trying. So many families are overstretched when it comes to housing costs. And I think that is because instead of asking ourselves, how much can I afford? We usually ask, how much will the bank lend me? Um, I chose this photo for this slide um, it's from my first book. It's the home of Shavonda Gardner, who is a designer and home influencer. And she and her family actually did downsize. Um, they'd been living in a home that was 2,500 square feet. And they chose with two kids who at the time they moved were about to be teenagers to move into a smaller house. And they made that choice because they wanted to be in a walkable neighborhood. They had literal rooms that they hadn't furnished in their big house yet. They wanted lower overhead. Um, and Shavanda's living room, I think, demonstrates small can be just as stylish as a bigger home. It doesn't have to mean that you're a minimalist living in a tiny house. Um, her house really shows that any style can work in a small home. So... If you're thinking about downsizing, if you have the suspicion that you're spending too much on housing, um, I encourage you to explore that idea. I've certainly dreamed of a bigger home at times, but I can honestly say, I don't think my family would be any happier with more space. And if there's anyone who visits my home and doesn't want to be my friend after seeing how small my house is, it's probably not a friend I need. Perhaps you're living in a small house and longing for more space. Um, a very real scenario. But one that I, I would say to pause and ask yourself, what's going on? I listen to a podcast where the host offers personal finance advice for um, couples who are having struggle with some aspect of their finances. And on a recent episode, a young couple was worried they couldn't afford to have a child because they thought they would need a bigger house to make room for their kid. This couple had a 1200 square foot house it's not twice the size of my apartment, but it's close. <laughs> 1,200 square foot feet might be a modestly sized house by American standards, but it's still a lot of space for two people. So what's going on here? My guess is that couple had filled their house up. It's so easy today to buy, to consume. Um, and this is where we get into trouble with the amount of space we have in our homes and also with sustainability. Um, at the core of being more sustainable is consuming less. 
And I believe that the core of living small, often it begins with that process of downsizing, decluttering, um, making space for more spaciousness in your home and your life. So um, less stuff equals more space. It's like literally the fastest, easiest way to make your home feel bigger is to take things out of it. Um, so whether that's some dramatic once in a lifetime Marie Kondo um, type of perch or a weekend here and there of editing, editing um, pairing back is key to living small. Okay, so this is a, a real life example from um, another writer that I know, Monique. She put herself a challenge. Um, she had a room in her basement that was essentially a junk room. This might look familiar to some. And she decided she was gonna donate, give away five things a day um, in an effort to clear out the space and use it in a way that was more fulfilling for her family. So two months in, she had cleared it out and made space for an at-home workout area. This is like a key example of how decluttering can actually give us back space in our homes. So a few ideas to kickstart decluttering. Um, one can be overwhelming. So I recommend doing it in small chunks, um, maybe 25 minutes a day. But uh, those 25 minutes should be focused, maybe set a timer and don't do anything else. Don't get a snack, don't check your phone. Um, you're just gonna focus on the task at hand. And there are a few like different methods to get you going. Um, one item a day this is like the babyest of baby steps. Or you can uh, do like Monique did, five items a day, get there faster. Um, then another method you could try, um, particularly if you live in a big house, it's what I call gone boxing. Place a box in every room that needs decluttering. And every time you find something that you're ready to part with, you put it in the box. And at the end of the month, you literally close the boxes and take them to your local charity. Photographic evidence is, I find very helpful. And I actually learned this through my professional life, photographing homes. Photographs can be very revealing. <laughs> um, if you take photos of a, a space you want to work on, it's definitely going to give you a fresh perspective on where clutter lurks. Um, even just before I came to meet with you guys today, I turned my camera out on my bookshelf and there was a glass over here. There were all these little bits and bobs that like, as soon as I saw the photo of them, you said, oh, I need to tidy up. So I think taking photos of the spaces you want to improve can be really powerful. Okay, now we're getting serious. Snowball method. Um, this one is my favorite and I find most effective. The idea is that on day one, you get rid of one thing. On day two, two things. On day three, three, four, five, so on. The amount getting bigger and bigger and bigger as you go along. Um, to some, this might sound crazy, but I promise there's probably at least 42 pens that don't work that you could get rid of in your house right now. Um, and I like this because you gain momentum and it becomes a little bit of a challenge to figure out what you can find for the next day. And finally, the buddy system. This for me is very effective. Choose one of these methods and get a friend to do it with you. 
take photos of the thing that you're planning to get rid of each day and text you to your friend. Having this like accountability partner is for me, a magic bullet of motivation. And it can also inspire some laughs. It can help, you know, keep you going when maybe you might lose steam on your own. And also pause too. Um, you'll notice I've said donate a lot. Um, and that's mostly because I want to encourage you not to just throw your hands up in the air and throw everything away. Ideally, when we're editing our homes, um, we're passing things on to somebody else who might be able to use them. If you already have a local charity that you know um, can use the things you're donating, that's great. But um, you also don't, we, we wanna donate responsibly too. Um, if you know in your heart of hearts that something is truly trash, you should throw it out rather than put it in the donate bag for charity. It's going to help the things that really do have value find homes if you're more responsible about what you're donating in the first place. Um, I also, my favorite thing is to give things directly to other people. To me, that's the most sustainable. Um, it guarantees that the item you're parting with is going to someone who genuinely wants it. Um, here in New York City, we have thriving buy nothing groups in practically every neighborhood in the city. And it's very easy to go onto Facebook, join the buy nothing group and give things away. And you would be amazed <laughs> what people will come to take. Um, if your community has Craigslist, there's a free section on Craigslist. Facebook Marketplace, you can give things away for free. Um, but giving things directly to another person ensures it's not landfill bound. And I find that giving to someone directly also, like it gives you a good feeling. It inspires you to want to keep on editing your own belongings down so that those things can go and be useful out in the world. And there's a ripple effect there too. If I donate um, my child's play table and chairs, which he's outgrown to another family, they get that thing for free, which is amazing. My table and chair stays out of the landfill and they don't have to go buy a new one, which is creating more consumption and using up more resources. So just wanted to take a little pause there to mention that. So it would be magical if we could all declutter once and that would be the end of it all. <laughs> but to live a truly small and sustainable life, um, I think that you have to change your relationship to consumption. Um, your closet will keep filling right back up if you don't stop buying more clothes. To keep the kitchen from overflowing, you have to resist the urge to buy another cute tray or tea towel that you saw at the home goods stores. Consuming less is truly the most essential thing we can do in our efforts to live a more sustainable life. So here's just a overview of how I try to adopt a less is more mindset. I always try to shop with a list and stick to it. This prevents me from overspending, buying things I don't need. Um, and this is whether I'm at the grocery store or a big box store like Costco or shopping for clothes, going in knowing exactly what you're looking for rather than just shopping because you need an outfit um, can really make a difference. Then distance yourself from temptation. I like to encourage people to unsubscribe from all the retailer email lists that you're on. I call on the phone to ask to be removed from catalog mailing lists. Um, stop following brands on social media. 
stop following influencers who make you feel the urge to buy and consume more. Um, if you're really looking to disconnect, take a break from social media altogether. 24 hour rule. This one is so basic, so easy, but if you see something that you really think you need, bookmark it, or if you're in a physical store, ask the store to put it on hold for you, and then just wait a day and see how you feel. Chances are that you might not need it after all. Um, and once you get a little more advanced, I now wait 48 hours before making any purchases. Okay, heart of sustainability. Use what you've got. <laughs> Sometimes the urge to buy something new um, is really just a desire for change. So try to look for ways to find novelty in what you already own. Maybe that's like switching around the pillow covers on your couch or draping a colorful bedspread over your sofa. You could open up your closet and spend half an hour writing down new outfit combinations. Or just take everything off of your fridge door and give yourself a clean slate there in that piece of the kitchen. Move your furniture around. Even if you ended up putting it all back exactly where it was before, at least you'll have experienced a shift in perspective. Okay. Stop shopping for fun. Um, if you cut out shopping as a form of leisure, you're way less likely to overconsume. I was never the type of person who would spend a weekend afternoon at boutiques or a mall, but I definitely used to go to the flea market every weekend. And for me, I still love the thrill of the secondhand hunt. Um, but now I try to enjoy the fun of just finding the things, not always bringing them home. But if you stop shopping as a, a form of relaxation, promise your sustainability quotient will go way up. Say no to freebies. This is where even an avowed minimalist can get into trouble because when something is free, it is so hard to pass up. But every free thing is going to need dusting and cabinet space in your home. And then it's going to be your responsibility to offload it later when you decide you don't want it. Um, and the more we can say no to these freebies, the more we tell people that we don't want another T-shirt another tote bag, um, we'll, we'll slow down the cycle of consumption. And then edit every day. What does that mean? No matter how vigilant you are about not shopping, keeping clutter out of your home, it has a sneaky way of returning magazines pile up, party favors come home, socks go missing, pens migrate from your office to your kitchen. So doing that sweep every night, putting things back in their places, um, you'll be able to really sense when your, your home is starting to fill up again and when it's time to do another big edit. So baby steps to living small. Um, this is for advice for anyone who's trying to imagine downsizing. And just want to say that if, if that's where you are, go slowly. Overnight change is not possible when we're talking about downsizing a home. Um, but if your goal is to move to a smaller space, Start with all this decluttering and de-owning that we're talking about, and that'll start to get you there. Um, okay, number one, I say deal with your storage unit. People don't like this, <laughs> um, but I feel like it is 
a waste of money to store things that you're not actively using. And I speak from experience. I had a storage unit once um, and it was a pretty astonishing experience to rent storage, spend six months without those things, and then come back and look in at a sea of boxes and not really be totally sure what was even in there. So I say, if you're thinking about downsizing, start with whatever's in your storage unit. Then give yourself a small sense of small. What do I mean by that? If you live in a big home, you could close all the doors to your guest rooms, the attic, maybe the formal dining room. And maybe even put a little piece of blue painter's tape over the door um, and see how long you can go before entering these spaces and what causes you to enter when you do. A lot of people are reluctant to downsize because maybe they want to host guests. Um, but you might discover it'd be far cheaper to pay for a guest hotel room twice a year than maintain the larger home. Um, likewise, if your attic or your basement is only housing the things you no longer actively use and need, maybe you could move into a smaller house and just get rid of those things. So imagining that those excess spaces aren't there. <sighs> to be a small space anthropologist, um, I'm asking you to observe friends and family who are living in smaller homes than you. Um, read books, magazines, newsletters about small spaces. Try to glean what might work and what won't work for you and your family. Perhaps your family could forego the formal dining room, or maybe you'd be fine with a teeny tiny bedroom. Um, test drive timing. Before taking the leap of like actually moving to a smaller space, I recommend trying it out beforehand. Maybe if you're going on a vacation, um, rent a small house instead of staying in a hotel. Give it a try. See what it feels like. If you own a large home and you're thinking about downsizing to a smaller owned home, perhaps you could rent your own home out and rent a smaller space for a year, ideally pocketing a profit um, if you're unsure. And you might be able to see how it feels and test drive it before you make the big step of selling your home. And then plan, 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 plan some more. Um, anytime you downsize, it's a big endeavor. You're going to want to sketch out floor plans, measure, figure out how to fit your current life into your new smaller home before making a move. Okay. Getting close to the end here some small rules to live by. Live with what you love. Um, talked a little bit about decluttering and the big idea is that once you've edited things down, you'll be surrounded by those that are useful or loved or ideally both. Um, and that is a really nice thing, living surrounded by things that you love. Don't hoard. We live, we are so blessed. We live in a time of great abundance. Don't hang on to things that you might use one day. Somebody else can probably use them today. And that is the most sustainable choice. Um, use resources wisely. So big idea that living small is sustainable, but it doesn't give you a free pass to blast the AC at max or skip composting or drive an enormous gas guzzling SUV. Um, we want to conserve resources in all of our daily actions. Want better, not more. 
Those are words to live by in any walk of life, but especially in a small space in which your possessions are edited down. Um, buy only what you need. Technology has made it really easy, easier than ever to borrow things that we use infrequently from books to power tools to camping gear. Uh, just right before this call, Jenna and I were talking and she said, you know, maybe I need to get a Kindle. And my Kindle plus my library book keeps me from consuming, you know, dozens of books every year. <sighs> Tidy and organized daily. Oops, sorry, went too fast. Okay, um, a house doesn't keep itself. Secret to a happy home is for everything to have a place. And unfortunately, we all still have to do the work, put it back there. And last, be thankful for your home. Um, you know, no matter where you're living, caring for your home, keeping it tidy, showing it love, um, it will reward you every day, and bring you satisfaction. Okay, so coming up on the Q&A section here in just a minute, but before that, I wanna give you guys a little homework. This is actionable advice anybody could take to try their hand at living more sustainably and living small. And that's, even if you live in an enormous house, this would be a form of living small. So, I propose to try a no shopping week. Um, this doesn't mean you wouldn't buy anything if you need to get groceries, of course, um, but not to buy any physical things just for one week. Um, see what that would look like. And if the week experiment doesn't feel that hard, go for a month. Um, some people do this for an entire year. So just not shopping, pausing anytime you're about to buy your way out of a problem can be a really powerful experiment. Homework number two is to unsubscribe from triggers. Anybody could do this right now after we hang up from this call, go into your email, Go on to Instagram and just unfollow and unsubscribe to the things that make you want to shop, whether that's a sale email from Madewell or um, a home influencer who's always sharing beautiful things that are in her home, whatever it is, unsubscribe from the thing that makes you decide to consume more. Take photos. Um, I suggested this earlier and I, I really mean it. If there is a space in your home you want to improve, start with photos. Um, they will reveal a lot to you and they will also be really satisfying to you after you've done work to, whether it's to declutter or to beautify, whatever it is, if there's a space you want to improve, Giving yourself that before and after, even if you don't show it to anyone else, it's very satisfying. Okay, number four is maybe silly, <laughs> but make your bet every day. Um, if you don't already do this, there's like literally scientific studies that show that people who make their beds um, have greater success in life. But it's this tiny thing you can do every day that says you're in control of your home. It's the biggest piece of real estate in your bedroom. So by making it look great, you're automatically going to have this part of your home that's looking better every day. Um, so that it's a little challenge to anyone out there who's not a bed maker yet. And then the last is to clear some horizontal surfaces. And I include this because this is actually my own Achilles heel. Um, Horizontal surfaces just have a tendency to gather stuff on them. I don't even want to look over at the other side of the room, see mine. But if you clear off your coffee table, your bureau top, maybe your bedside table, those are like the highest impact places that you can declutter in your home and 
really feel what that spaciousness is going to look like. So those are those are my five assignments for you for how to start living more sustainably and living small. And I think we can start taking questions. Um, if anybody wants to drop them in the chat. I am ready. <laughs> Laura, I have a question for you. Um, what are some of your favorite organization tools or products that you recommend or use yourself? Well, I do like to say that you don't have to buy anything to get organized. Yeah. Um, and that's often a trap we all fall into. We think we we need to go out and buy bins. Um, mm -hmm. But for me, I tend to like things that are made from natural materials, um, both because I, plastic, I like to avoid because it will never biodegrade. Um, and because things that are made from like wood or fabric will um, just look nicer. Um, mm -hmm. So I... I'm a big believer in wooden hangers, canvas bins, anything that um, is made from something that breathes and, you know, looks nice as well. Awesome. Thank you. Um, someone is asking for advice on how to keep others from constantly putting things down on horizontal surfaces. <laughs> well, I think that that is an interesting question. If you're talking about like a five-year-old kid, it may be a losing battle, but if it's another an adult or a child who's um, old enough to be responsible for their belongings, my guess is whatever they're putting down is something that doesn't have a home. Usually if something's cluttering up a horizontal surface, it's because that thing doesn't have a place where it should permanently live. So I think that the trick then is like, look at the thing that keeps coming back and say, okay, how can we make a real home for this? Um, Laura asks about ideas for my own kids' birthday presents for a party when they really don't need anything. Experience gifts are nice, but they can be hard for kids because kids like to open things. Um, so, this will really depend kid by kid, but let's say um, like my son would love to go to Legoland um, and Legoland is not something that's going <laughs> to clutter up our home, um, but maybe, maybe he would get a small Lego kit as the representation of like what he could open up. Cause kids do like to open presents and saying, just give them an experience is tricky. Um, my family also likes to try and do, um, a lot of my kids' gifts are things that he actually needs. Um, so he might get a really cool t-shirt as one of his birthday gifts, because um, obviously it needs to wear clothes, um, but something maybe that mom wouldn't normally buy him, um, like a Minecraft t-shirt, uh, sneaking in useful things as gifts can also be an effective tactic. Um, Someone else asked about how do you get your family to buy into declutter, decluttering when they love all the stuff? Um, I don't know if that means immediate family or uh, larger family like grandparents buying for children. Um, but if it's someone buying something for your family, you know, I think really emphasizing that your place is full you don't have room for more things and giving them ideas of things that they can give you that don't take up space. Um, I told my mom this year, I wanted to have a museum membership for Christmas and I've lived in New York for 25 years and I've never been a member of the Metropolitan Museum of Art, but now I am. <laughs> so it, helping people with ideas. Um, someone else asks, holidays, traveling, cooking together, sharing. Um, my family still exchanges gifts. We, I found that a no gift Christmas is sad, but we definitely try to focus on 
shared meals, shared experiences. Um, cousins all went ice skating together this year, for example. And um, I also think that with holidays, the more you can actively engage with your family um, as a whole to talk about it, the better. I envy people with a big family. I'm trying to get my family to do like a white elephant kind of style gift where all the grownups would buy one gift and do a gift exchange that way. I think that would be so fun. Um, someone else has about digital hoarding as a way to avoid physical things. I'm so curious about that. And that sounds like a great topic for a future newsletter. Um, I, I'm not sure what the answer is there. Um, I, I, I will have to think about that, but I promise to address that in a future newsletter. Um, someone else is chiming in to say that national park and state park passes are a great gift. I love that idea. Um, and that's something too, that like the idea of an experience gift, you could print that out, put it in an envelope, um, and maybe, you know, find some physical representation that's consumable to go with it. Um, what else? I've got another one here. What do we do on the weekends? Um, my family likes to hike a lot and be outdoors. We try to get outdoors, uh, both, both weekend days if we can. And that's like, a big part of family time for us. And we don't um, go out to eat during the week for dinner very much. We don't order or take out. So for us, uh, going out to lunch on Saturday and Sunday is like a, a family activity and a little bit of a treat. Um, and we like to spend time with friends. Um, and that can be casual, just people coming over or like actually hosting people for meals. But definitely... Being outside is uh, really restorative. Oh, someone asked how you can subscribe to my newsletter. Thank you for asking this. Uh, my newsletter is distributed through Substack. Uh, the free version comes out every other week and I would be thrilled to have you all join me there. Um, and then there are bonus additions for paid subscribers in additional weeks. And I will definitely be discussing digital hoarding <laughs> in a future newsletter. Has anyone else got any questions that I can help with? It's interesting that holidays and gift giving came up because um, I know, you know, those, it's hard. We are trained to, to shop and to buy stuff. And it's like so, so hard to, um, to dial it back. Um, and I'll, I'll share a little experience from my own life this year. Um, we were trying to, we sometimes try to do it for our son, um, something you need, something to read, something you want. Um, wait, I did this wrong book, clothes, something to wear, something to read, something you want, something you need as the gifts. And so he had a pretty modest little list of gifts and we flew to visit our in-laws and um his cousin's gifts filled literal garbage bags <laughs> that his parent there you know my my sister and brother-in-law had gotten for their kids and I spent Christmas Eve going to sleep just terrified that my son was going to be so disappointed that he got less than the other kids, like less volume. Um, but if you do the work, uh, I think, you know, like we were rewarded, like our kid didn't notice that he had fewer things. He got the one thing he really wanted, which was a Swiss army knife. <laughs> And he wasn't focused on the the sheer quantity. Um, so kids are kids are more resilient than we give them credit for. Um, someone else is asking about unwanted gifts. I give them away, um, and my family knows that. Goodness, um, 
I think it's okay. Uh, there's no sense in something staying in your home unused, unloved, um, taking up space when it could be out in the world serving someone else. And if you have the kind of family member who is going to notice and be upset, um, I feel like there's like a bigger, bigger issue there. <laughs> um, so, and then someone else asks here about paperwork. Um, I do have some, I can give a little bit of very quick advice there. Um, I am a big believer in digital billing. I get every one of my bills that I can paperless, um, including all my bank statements, my credit card statements. Um, it's just as easy to look at my credit card statement online and check the charges as it is to look at a piece of paper. So anything you can opt into digitally, I think you should. Um, I also believe in automatic payments to make sure you don't miss anything. There's a website called DMA Choice, I believe .org, where for $2, you can pay to have your name and mailing address removed from um, junk mail lists. I have found it to be very effective. Um, and there is another opt-out site for um, credit card offers. Um, I think it's opt-out screen. If you search for that, um, that will cut down on the mail coming in. For kid-related paperwork, um, and then it comes home from school, I immediately just deal with it, whatever it is. If it's a permission slip, it's back in the folder. If it's an announcement about Spirit Week, I put the Spirit Weeks onto the calendar and recycle the paper, um, really trying to address the paper as it's coming in right away so it doesn't build up. Uh, the website for junk mail is DMA Choice, DMA. It's the Direct Marketers Association. Um, and I think it's $2 is what you pay to get taken off the lists. Um, it's also very effective if you were plagued by catalogs um, to just keep calling them. I tear the back page off of every catalog that comes to my house. And once I've got about six of them, I'll take 10 minutes to call them up and ask once again to please take me off the list. Um, but if you stop, if you take your shopping pause to the next level, fewer catalogs will show up as well. <laughs> okay, I think we've gotten to the end of questions. Um, if anyone else wants to hop in, we've got a minute or two more. Um, and I, it's been fun to hear your questions and exciting for me to see that there's still more to say about Birthdays and holidays and gifts. All right. I think we will go ahead and wrap up. Thank you so much, Laura. This was so insightful and eye-opening. Um, I have lived in the same apartment with my partner for about three years now. And I've lately been just feeling like I'm I've outgrown or we've outgrown our space, but more I think about it, like nothing much has changed in my life to make that case. <laughs> so I feel like maybe it's just, you know, a case of getting bored of my space or consuming and collecting more things. So all the advice you shared on consuming less, decluttering, shifting your mindset or just your space around really resonated, resonated with me. So Thank you so much for your time. Um, I really enjoyed learning alongside all of you. And I look forward to seeing you at future Dream Bank events. Thank all you. Right. Thank you so much for having me.